Hi, this is Kristen Easta. I would like to start off from a quote from Wikipedia with the definition of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the mental stress or discomfort experienced by an individual who holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time, or is confronted by new information that conflicts with existing beliefs, ideas, or values. Last weekend, when I first heard about Dr. Daniel's report, my first thought that came to mind is cognitive dissonance that perhaps the people of Weston A. Price Foundation, when confronted with the possibility that Green Pastures cod liver oil might not be a good product, they would be unable to accept it. And this is why I think that it's good to review Dr. Daniel's concerns and not to just immediately discard them. But at the same time, I also feel like it's important to review some of the backlash that has come out this week in response to her report. Two responses that came out this week stood out to me above the rest. The first one was from Sally Fallon Morales, Questions and Answers, and she is the Weston A. Price Foundation president currently, and then also Dr. Chris Masterjohn. So, one point that they both made was the problem with monopolies. Chris pointed out that we should really have a place for both fermented cod liver oil and unfermented cod liver oil. He pointed out that there was historical evidence that both cod liver oils had been used for medicinal purposes at different periods in the past. And it was also pointed out in my research that Weston A. Price Foundation actually does recommend the use of not just green pastures oil, but also Rosita, Nutra Pro International, and Nature's Answer. And these are unfermented cod liver oils. Sally also pointed out in her questions and answers that other companies needed to market fermented cod liver oils as well. One thing that Chris brought up that was really interesting was that there's problems with cod liver oil in general. Chris pointed out that large amounts can actually be toxic. And so there was one example of someone taking too much and then they had heart failure. And, and he said that large amounts can be toxic, so you just need to take the recommended dose. And it's not one of those instances where more is actually better. And he also saw it as a convenience food. And that he said that if you're eating lots of liver and other healthy foods, you might not even need cod liver oil. But it's more of a necessity if your diet's not good and you just want to put it in for convenience for the a, vitamins A and D. So now I'll go into some of the rebuttals that they had in their two reports. The first issue that really stood out to me was about the concept of fermentation. In Dr. Daniel's reports, I got the concept that microbes only feed on carbohydrates. Well, Chris seemed to present that this was a rather narrow view because he asserts that microbes can actually feed on lipids and proteins for energy as well. And he says he gets this from food science textbooks as well as microbiology textbooks. In Sally's question and answers, um, she brought forth the point that there's actually glycogen in livers that can be fermented. So I thought that was rather interesting. And in doing my own research, I did find that there was many traditional food-based ferments of fish. So I thought all of those points were very interesting that came out this week. Also, um, along with many other people, um, they also made the point that Pollock actually is cod. So Sally didn't see a problem with calling Pollock cod as they are in the same family. And Chris thought there was actually some historical evidence that he had in his notes of Pollock being used for cod liver oil in the past. But he definitely said that better labeling of where the product is coming from would, would definitely be good. Now, Chris also makes a long argument in his report on why green pastures cod liver oil is actually not rancid. Now, not being a scientist, 
I recommend that you go ahead and read his report for yourself. Lastly, I just want to say that I love Chris's ending to his report, where he calls for an open dialogue about the topic, and he said that he actually appreciated Dr. Daniels being a watchdog. And I agree. I feel like I've learned an immense amount in the discussion that has come out in response to Dr. Daniels' report. So I, I appreciate not only her report, but also the backlash against it. I'll go ahead and leave links in the comments, and I thank you for watching.